But um, we have been on a journey, just to place this in context here, um, I preached a sermon on um, really women, the roles of women in the church and such out of First Timothy this past summer, and you can find it uh, on our website or on YouTube somewhere if you want to listen to that, but really outlined kind of a journey we've been on as a church uh, for decades, really. Um, I was here as a youth pastor back in the day and then been gone for a bit back, and so I've been a part of this church for, stay how many years? 22 total on staff, right? But then 30 some odd or so in the midst of it all. So we've been, we, we've walked through a lot, but even before I, I got here, our church has been on a journey. And, and it's been one where we've said, hey, let's, let's look deep into what scripture says. Let's have dialogues about this. What does it mean for, for women uh, in the church? And what, what, what should that look like? So um, we came to a point along the way, this is probably 15 plus years ago now, where we decided that scripture seems to us, at least, uh, we have women deacons. Uh, we have ordained women deacons. In fact, uh, Terry Hurd just won. That wasn't planned. That wasn't like, <laughs> but she's an incredible leader in our church. We have women who, who preach and teach in our church. And um, that's where we've, we've landed. Okay, but we're still growing. We're, we're still learning. A lot of you, maybe like me, if you grew up in Baptist world, I mean, my, so my grandfather was the president of the Southern Baptist Convention. I'm, I'm like Baptist. Somebody said Baptist royalty. I'm like, uh, no, I don't know about that. But I, so I'm, I like, I grew up in it. And, and I grew up in really what would be a complementarian home and that kind of thing. We'll talk about that tonight a little bit. So I've been on a journey um, as well. And uh, it's been a wonderful thing just to learn and still grow and still learn. Uh, and we're going to do that tonight. So that's what these, these conversations are about. Just learning and growing together as God's people. And we want to model that well. So just coming together, we think, is a win. I think in the end, it's not just whether you agree or disagree, but to have conversations. And then I, I would think, too, read the book, and however you come out on the back end of that is a win. Um, just to say, hey, you know what? People who might disagree with me, they could love Jesus, too. This is amazing, right? Uh, because whatever's core, we're going we're gonna to guard it with everything we got. The gospel of Jesus, the core gets really, really pointed. Um, whatever's non-core, hey, we're going to offer a lot of grace and love each other. So, Dr. Beth Allison Barr is professor of history uh, and associate dean at the graduate school there at Baylor University. Anybody? Okay. Um, they won the national championship in basketball, I heard. I, if, just thought I'd throw that out. Anyway, however, um, she, she specializes in medieval history, which is fascinating. Middle Ages, kind of middle, medieval history, women's history, and church history. She's um, the author of several books, has done a lot of writing, and she told me, don't go on about all that much. She's done some great podcasts that we could point you to as well, even recently. Uh, this book that we're looking at tonight, The Making of Biblical Womanhood, um, the, I've told her the subtitle kind of, kind of breaks the ice a little bit, um, how the subjugation of women became gospel truth. And that's really what the book is about. She's married to a pastor, um, 24 years, and she's a mother of two. And so let's do this. I want to pray, and then we'll have her come up. Let's pray together, all right? Lord, thank you so much for this night where we get to come and be here with your people. Uh, how good it is uh, to be together in a day where we, yeah, not as much gathering in moments like this and space like this. So I pray that you would um, bring your spirit upon us, and I pray that we learn. I pray we come with a lot of uh, grace and open hearts and minds, that you would speak to us. And I pray at the end of it all that we would be drawn closer to you as a result of being together, because you are Lord. We love you, and we praise you for this time. We pray that you'll bless Dr. Barr as she comes to share with us now. In Jesus' name. Amen. So let's welcome Dr. Beth Allison Barr. Right. Thank you. Yeah. It is great to be here. I didn't actually tell Jeff this, but um, my grandparents were Fort Worth, and my grandfather grew up in Travis Avenue Baptist Church. And I remember one time he said he used to joke about being a Baptist. And he would say, Baptist born and Baptist bred, and when I die, I'll be Baptist dead. So, you know, so I, I have those deep Baptist roots um, also on my mother's side. Well, thank you for being with me today. 
Um, I will warn you, I am a college professor, so um, I'll try. I'll try to make it, you know, as entertaining as I can. Um, in fact, we're going to have a little bit of audience interaction. So feel free when I get to that part. I will. I want to have you uh, talk with me. So we'll start off, and I'm going to start off with a quote from a podcast some of y'all may have been listening to. So we'll see. If not, you might want to listen to it. It's pretty interesting. Um, if a biblical woman is kind of meek and submissive and sweet and quiet. I'll try my darndest to do that. That is not my kind of normal or natural disposition. But if that is what makes me fit in, if that is what fits the mold of how this is supposed to look, I'll try that. Jen Smith recently said these words, these almost desperate words, in an interview with Mike Cosper. For those of you not in the know, Jen Smith is the wife of the former Mars Hill pastor, Phil Smith. And she was being interviewed for Christianity Today's smash hit podcast, The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill. Are any of y'all listening to that? Yeah, that's interesting. I have some thoughts on it. Um, shortly after Jen Smith made this comment, Mike Cosper, who was the writer and producer of the podcast, explained the context of her words. In Cosper's words, Women at Mars Hill, the now defunct megachurch in Seattle founded by lead pastor Mark Driscoll, were taught to be domestic, retreating, and deferential. And Mike Cosper is right about this. Take, for example, the now infamous sermon in which Mark Driscoll called out the husbands of working women as selfish. How dare you make her shoulder her half of the curse and part of yours as well, he shouted. He really did shout. He also used another word in conjunction with selfish that I'm not going to say. Um, his reputation as the cussing pastor is well deserved. In other words, women at Mars Hill were taught exactly the biblical womanhood that I describe in my book, The Making of Biblical Womanhood. In my words, God designed women primarily to be submissive wives virtuous mothers and joyful homemakers. God designed men to lead in the home as husbands and fathers, as well as in church as pastors, elders, and deacons. Women surrender and help and respond while husbands provide, protect, and initiate. But where does this idea come from? This idea that men are divinely called to lead while women are divinely called to follow now, as surely as I'm speaking these words, I bet a few scripture passages are coming to mind, right? Like Ephesians 5. I won't ask how many of you had that read in your wedding. Wives, submit to your husbands. The pastor who married me is here. It wasn't read in our wedding, I can tell you that. Um, even then. 1 Timothy 2.12, I do not permit a woman to teach or assume authority over a man. 1 Corinthians 14.34, Women should remain silent in the churches, right? These are the verses that are coming to mind as I'm talking here. So what you are thinking about is exactly what a group of men who founded the Council for Biblical Manhood and Womanhood in the late 1980s were thinking. That biblical womanhood is ordained by the Bible. In the preface to the 2006 edition of Recovering Biblical Manhood and Womanhood, Legan Duncan was so certain that the Bible ordains biblical womanhood that he described egalitarianism as pagan. Before I read you his quote, I should tell you that Recovering Biblical Manhood and Womanhood was originally published in 1991 by Crossway for the Council on Biblical Manhood and Womanhood. And Legan Duncan is the Chancellor of Reformed Theological Seminary, as well as a board member for both the Gospel Coalition and the Council for Biblical Manhood and Womanhood. And yes, there's a pattern. Listen to what Legan Duncan writes. And this is a little long of a quote, but I'm going to unpack it for you, okay? So just listen for some key words. He writes, Pagan ideas underlie evangelical egalitarianism based as it is on ideas borrowed from cultural feminism, which for him is like post-1960s. Egalitarianism must always lead to an eventual denial of the gospel, hence the 
subtitle of my book. When the biblical distinctions of male and female are denied, Christian discipleship is irretrievably damaged because there can be no talk of cultivating masculine or feminine virtue. One can only speak of vague, androgynous discipleship. But that's not how God made us. We need masculine males and feminine females in order to generate the kind of discipleship that results in a commitment to complementarianism. As I said, there's a lot in that quote. So I'm going to unpack it for you, okay? Two main points from it. First, Duncan argues that evangelical egalitarianism does not stem from the Bible, but rather from the modern cultural movement of feminism. To make sure we are all on the same page, evangelical egalitarianism argues that God calls women and men equally to serve in leadership roles in the church. Moreover, in regard to marriage, mutual submission is emphasized between husbands and wives. Second, Duncan argues that in contrast to evangelical egalitarianism, complementarianism is the only faithful interpretation of the Bible. In fact, it's often seen as one of the early steps on the staircase that leads to atheism, okay? A lot of people have sent me that picture over Twitter. Um, to make sure, so, that's, so it's the only faithful interpretation of the Bible. Again, to make sure we are all on the same page, complementarianism argues that although women and men are spiritually equal, God calls them to di different and distinct complementary roles, this is the crux of biblical womanhood. Biblical womanhood calls women to supportive rather than leadership roles. It also emphasizes family as women's primary calling as a Christian woman. What I'd like to do for the next 25-ish, 30 minutes or so, is examine this concept of biblical womanhood. Let's see if it's really biblical. And then I'm going to let you ask me a lot of questions, okay? So that's what we're doing. So now I told you we're going to have audience participation. So this is the moment. I'm going to read to you two stories. And after I read each one, I'm going to stop and ask you to tell me who the woman is, okay? Can y'all do that? Does that sound good? Okay. Now I'm going to ask you to do something too, which I always ask my students. Don't Google it, okay? <laughs> so just look at your neighbors. Don't Google it, okay? Um, so here's the first one. First story, a natural born homemaker, this woman was stuck in the house of her brother. She really wished she could have been married by now, but she wasn't. Instead, she was keeping house for her brother and younger sister. One day, a family friend and religious teacher came to stay along with several of his disciples. Suddenly, there were so many things to do, food to be prepared, linens to be changed, floors to be swept. Anxious she wouldn't get the work done in time, she began looking for her sister to help her. How irritated she was to find her sister sitting in the living room with their guest. She was just sitting there and listening to him talk. The guest, however, so this woman scolded her sister, telling her to get up and help. The guest, however, intervened. Household chores, he said, were not always the most important matter. The ordinary duties of life should not take precedence over spiritual pursuits. This woman's sister had chosen the better part. Okay, who is she? Martha, Martha, Martha of Bethany. Okay, I think that if you didn't say that, you can pretend you did. Um, so it's Martha of Bethany. Everybody got that. It was pretty obvious. I won't ask you how familiar that story was to you. Um, the story that I recounted is loosely based on one of the two places where we really see a lot of Martha. The other one is in John. Luke 10, 38 through 42. I also drew the dramatized retelling from books such as The Christian Homemaker's Handbook, which was published in 2013 by Patricia Ann Ennis and Dorothy Kelly Patterson from Crossway Press. It was endorsed by Elizabeth George and Robert Jeffress. I think you know who he is. Um, as well as many articles on John Piper's Desiring God website. Indeed, John Piper's 2016 tweet sort of sums up evangelical perceptions of Martha. He wrote, Martha is preparing a feast for Jesus while Mary is feasting on the words of Jesus. Okay, that was easy. Are you all ready for the second story? Okay, good. Same deal. Don't Google her. Um, and I promise it's a biblical woman, okay? 
This woman was one of the earliest followers of Jesus. She was one of the first to believe that Jesus truly was the Messiah who had come to save the world. Indeed, when asked point blank who she thought Jesus was, she responded, I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. After the resurrection and ascension, chances are she was alongside the earliest followers of Jesus praying together in the upper room. She certainly heeded the words of Jesus to go out from Jerusalem and make disciples of all the world. After Pentecost, she sailed across the Mediterranean to the shores of a land we know today as France. She began to preach the gospel of Jesus to all the people there. Hundreds converted to Christianity. One day, this woman wandered into the woods and went down to the river. There on the shore, she encountered the gruesome sight of a dragon eating a man. According to the text, it was, quote, half beast and half fish, greater than an ox, longer than a horse, having teeth sharp as a sword and horned on either side, head like a lion, tail like a serpent with two wings. It could not be beaten with stones or other weapons and was as strong as 12 lions. But this woman was not afraid. She sprinkled holy water on the beast, which she happened to have on her in a wand tucked in her cloak, and then she paralyzed it by showing it the image of the cross. It was easy after that. She calmly tied up the dragon with her girdle and waited for the local townspeople to come and stab it to death with her spears, with their spears. This woman continued working alongside her family, preaching and performing miracles and spreading the good news of Jesus. Don't Google her. Who is she? She's Martha. She is Martha of Bethany. She's the same woman, okay? I heard the little Mary Magdalene that... Mary was with her in France, according to the story. So I'll I'll give you, I'd give you half credit for that. Um, Christianity Today actually was surprising, had an article come out on Martha just two days ago. So anyway, she is the same Martha who, when Jesus, in the conversation with Jesus, recognized who Jesus was. She said, I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into this world. However, The dramatized version of her story did not come from our modern evangelical world, and I bet you probably guessed that, right? It came from the medieval world. It is from an insanely popular religious text called the Golden Legend. Some of you may have actually seen it before or maybe read parts of it. Compiled in the mid-13th century by a friar and the later bishop of Genoa, it is a compendium of saints' lives and doctrinal instruction to aid medieval priests in their preaching and teaching. More than a 1,000 copies of it survive today. And I know that doesn't seem like large numbers for us now, thinking about how many books sell, or actually how many books don't sell. But nonetheless, but more than a 1,000 copies of it survive, which means it was a medieval bestseller, okay? I mean, this is a crazy amount of copies. So I want you to vote now, more audience participation. And what I, I just want you to shout out one or two when I ask the question, okay? Can you do that? I want you to tell me which dramatized version of Mary's life is more biblically accurate. So tell me if you think the first one's more biblically accurate. Y'all are afraid. You can shout it out too. I still, are y'all afraid? You don't know? Well, it's like, I don't know. There's, it's okay. What, 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 how many of you think the first one is it? Okay, I got a few more. How about the second one? A lot of y'all didn't participate. Um, So I can see that at least. I can see a lot. Why didn't you participate? Are you uncertain? You're scared? (laughs) Yeah. Um, Okay. So, uh, well, you you know, uh, there was division there on what it was. Um, More people said they thought the first one was. A few people said the second one, but I wonder if you just thought that because that's where I was going to go. Um, So, you know, maybe we're following context clues. Okay. Um, But what I guess, maybe I should ask the question this way. Which story is more familiar to you? Okay. How many of you had ever heard the second one? Anybody read the Christianity Today article? If you read my book, you've read some of the second one. Okay, yeah. Okay, so the first one's very familiar to you. This dramatized story as Martha as the irritated hostess, right? That's where we know Martha. Um, We don't really know her as the preaching dragon slayer, okay? Although that's a really fun Martha to know. Um, Okay, so now this is where it gets really interesting. Now I've gotten y'all talking with me a little bit, so that's good. 
Um, let's look, and I encourage, now you, if you want to pull out your phones, you can do it now. This is the point where I give you permission to do that. If you want to look at the text, okay, you don't have to, but if you want to look at the text, this is what it says, Luke 10, 38 through 42. We'll just read the whole thing. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. Okay. So we assume that because Martha welcomed Jesus into her home, this means that her tasks were domestic, right? Is that the picture that we've got? And you can think about all of your Sunday school pictures where you see pictures of Martha. You know, there's some great um, early modern ones where Martha's like, you know, pulling um, feathers out of birds and, you know, all sorts of things like this and, and Mary's in the background. So this is, we assume that the tasks are domestic. But does the text say that? Look at the text. Does it say that? Does it tell us what those tasks are? What if they're not domestic? Or at least that's not all of the story. What I want to do is look a bit more closely at this text and see if maybe we're reading that irritated hostess into the text instead of actually gleaning it from the text, okay? Warren Carter wrote a fascinating article in 1996. At the time, he was professor of New Testament at St. Paul's School of Theology and a recent graduate with his PhD from Princeton Theological Seminary. He since went on to become an acclaimed New Testament professor at Bright Divinity School, not far from here at TCU. And now he's the LaDonna Kramer Minders Professor of New Testament at Phillips Seminary in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Also not very far. He wrote an article that I encourage you all to go look up. The article is titled, Getting Martha Out of the Kitchen. Um, it's in the Catholic Biblical Quarterly from April 1996. Listen to what he says says, quote, while conventional analysis sees Martha as the harried hostess performing her kitchen duties without help from Mary, several indicators, indicators in the context and in the presentation of the scene indicate this to be an unlikely reading. Just think about that. Think about all the pictures and all that, you know, I won't ask how many have read, um, you know, having a merry heart in a Martha world and all sorts of books that have played on this for women. So why does he say that? First, he says, we need to consider the entire passage. Did you know, and this is something as a historian, um, you know, one of my favorite statements that Ben Witherington, I heard him say this in a lecture, and I've just never, never forgotten it. Um, he says, a text without a context is a pretext for saying whatever you want. And I just really love that because, you know, we just do that all the time. A text without a context is a pretext to say whatever we want. So what's the context of this story with Martha. Well, the context is it follows right after the mission of the 70, Luke 10, 1 through 20. As Carter Warren reminds us, Jesus tells his followers to enter a town and find someone to receive them. Being received, writes Carter, involves more than being supplied with food and drink. It primarily denotes the embracing of the disciples' mission and its eschatological reality. This positive description, this is me now, this positive description of how Jesus' followers should be received as they go out on mission is immediately followed by his positive reception of Martha. Not as a domestic caretaker, but as a disciple and master of her household. We, Martha doesn't have a husband. She's probably the oldest of the siblings. She's the master of that household. As Carter writes, quote, Martha's receiving Jesus signifies her commitment to Jesus's mission and to the God who sent him. She appears as the model disciple. Well, 
that changes things just a little bit, doesn't it? Let's get to Warren Carter's second point, and then we're going to read some more scripture, okay? He says that the word diaconia, Luke 10, 40, that we often interpret as domestic tasks for Martha doesn't mean domestic tasks. It's an action word for a messenger, a go-between. Go look at, go look at the blueletterbible.org. Go look it up. Go look up diaconia. An officiator, a meteor, a mediator, a minister, and someone attending on the needs of others, which could include service during a meal. The word does not designate subservient status as it is often applied to those in leadership positions. Indeed, the primary New Testament usage of the word diaconia is actually ministry. Y'all, it's the word we get deacon from, okay? There's our deacon right there, right? Um, it's the word we get deacon from. So let's just walk through some scripture here. Because isn't that what we're supposed to do as Baptists? You know, we use the Bible to interpret the Bible, right? So let's use the Bible to interpret the Bible. Let's go look and see how this word that's used to describe Martha is used in other places by the author of Luke and Acts. And let's see what it does, okay? It's used nine times in Luke and Acts. Now, this word is a root word, so there are some other variations out there. But the way it's used in this text, the same word, it's used nine times in Luke and Acts, okay? So let's look and see how it's used. Again, feel free, look it up for me if you want to. First time we see it in Acts is in, twice, is in Acts chapter 1. And if you think about it, if you know what's going on, I'm teaching through Acts right now, and we spent a long time talking about this first chapter. It took us a while. I, I'm really slow when I teach things. Um, but in Acts chapter 1, if you remember, one of the first tasks that the disciples do after Jesus is the resurrection of Jesus um, is they have to elect a new disciple because they've lost Judas, right? And so in Acts chapter 1, they elect a new disciple. And the two times we see the use of this word, diaconia, is at the two times that they are talking about this election of a new disciple. So Acts 1, 17, for Judas was numbered among us and was allotted his share in the ministry, the diaconia. Acts 1, 25, show us which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry, diaconia, an apostleship from which Judas turned aside. Okay? It also appears twice in Acts 6. If you remember Acts 6, this is a part where they have a, a lot of people and they're growing in the leadership numbers, but the numbers of leaders are not keeping up with the number of people. And we have some widows that are getting left out, okay? So they have to choose more people. So it's the choosing of the seven to serve. Acts 6, 1, the disciples were increasing in number. The widows were being neglected in the daily ministrations, the diaconia, the daily ministry. Acts 6, 4, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to serving diaconia, the word. Serving the word. It appears in Acts chapter 11 and 12, this time in the context of the evangelists that are going out like Paul. And Barnabas. Acts 11 29. Then the disciples sent relief, ministry, diaconia to the believers living in Judea. Acts 12 25. Then after completing their mission, Barnabas and Saul returned to Jerusalem and brought with them John, whose other name was Mark, completing their diaconia, their ministry, their mission. And then the last two times we see it in Acts is in the context of Paul and Paul's ministry. Acts 20, 24, but I do not count my life of any value to myself if only I may finish my course and the diaconia that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify the good news of God's grace. And then in Acts 21, 19, after greeting them, Paul related one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles through his diaconia ministry. And then we have Martha, Luke 10, 40. And this is how we render it. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work? Tell her 
to help me. Think about what you just heard. What did you carry to the text? When you heard the word ministry, mission, service with the male disciples, did you see them preaching? Did you see them making decisions as leaders, teaching others, spreading the gospel? So you're correct. Diaconia clearly indicates ministry, preaching, teaching, evangelizing, caring for the poor, etc. As Warren Carter writes, rather than designating a person of inferior status involved in waiting or domestic service, the word tasks, serving, typically designates a commissioned spokesperson or agent, a go-between who ministers on behalf of God or the Christian community. But I bet, I won't make you raise your hands, when you first heard me read Martha's many tasks and the work Mary left to her, you envisioned a person involved in domestic duties, in the kitchen, standing at the table, maybe even doing, I've even, there's even one image where Martha's like sweeping the floor. It's in a Sunday school um, book, okay? But this connotation is not in the text. We have brought it to the text, the word diaconia for Martha's tasks is the same word applied to the ministry of Barnabas and Saul. In other words, Martha's tasks probably aren't cooking dinner, y'all, or at least not limited to presenting dinner. Martha's tasks are ministry. I'm pretty certain Martha wasn't a dragon slayer, okay, even though I really like that story and my students love that story. Pretty certain she wasn't a dragon slayer. But I'm just as certain she wasn't a domestic hostess either. If we look at Martha's work from the perspective of Barnabas and Saul, the medieval version of her story as a preaching evangelist, we'll just leave the dragon out of it, actually looks more accurate than that of the harried hostess. It would also make for more entertaining pictures in kids' Sunday school. Um... So what's my point? I recently listened to a sermon by your pastor, Jeff Warren. He discussed this scene from Luke 10, describing Mary as doing the work of the disciples when she sat at the feet of Jesus. I want y'all to know that Martha is also doing the work of the disciples. The biblical text describes the ministry of Martha with the same word it uses to describe the ministry of male disciples. Just let that sink in. If biblical womanhood, the idea that women are divinely ordained to be, in Legan Duncan's words, feminine females who do not encroach on the roles of masculine males, if this is biblical womanhood, then why does the Bible contradict it? Why does the Bible describe the ministry of a female disciple in the same way as a male disciple? And the Bible doesn't seem confused. Uh, concerned about confusing gender roles. There is just so much I could unpack for you along this same theme. We could discuss why, if the scene in Matthew 16 in which Peter names Jesus as God helped buttress Peter's, Peter's status as a disciple, why doesn't that parallel encounter between Martha and Jesus in John 11 do the same for Martha? Do you all know that those are the only two people who get Jesus right? It's Peter you are the son of the living God, and Martha, you are the Messiah, okay? They're the only two who get it. I don't think it's a coincidence that we have a man and a woman both telling us that. We could also discuss why the fact that Jesus named 12 men as disciples in the beginning of his ministry is often the ending point for conversations about women in leadership. I can't tell you how many times people have pulled that one on me. Be like, oh, but God, you know, Jesus only called 12 men. That's it. That's the end of the story. Do you know that that's not where Jesus ended the story? The Bible matters. <laughs> the Bible matters. Um, yes, the 12 disciples represent the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 sons. They also ensured Jesus' status as a rabbi. But Jesus doesn't stop with the 12 men. He brought women like Mary of Bethany and her sister Martha into his group of leaders. Just listen to the text. 
In Luke 6, Jesus designates the 12 apostles and then begins to teach them. But as I said, he doesn't stop there. You know, Jesus always takes us to places we don't expect to go. And he did this in this first century world. He invited women into spaces that only belong to men. Just two chapters over in Luke 8, Jesus adds women to this group of male leaders. As the text reads, look it up. Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The 12 were with him and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary called Magdalene from whom seven demons had come out. Joanna, the wife of Chusa, the manager of Herod's household. Susanna and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. Y'all, women were bankrolling the disciples, okay? We see this, yeah, I, that, that's also interesting. We could spend a lot of time on that too. Um, just like in chapter 6, after the naming these women, Jesus then begins to teach all who are gathered. Aren't these parallels interesting between men we accept as disciples and women who appear in the same ways as disciples? But I, I really want there to be time for questions. I think that'll be fun. So let's turn, let's stop with Luke, and let's turn to Paul for just a few minutes, okay? Um, specifically, let's turn to Romans 16. If you have your Bible or on your phone, I really encourage you to look it up, okay, and follow along with me as we read it. Um, I'm also one of those persons who pronounces names with great confidence without caring if I'm pronouncing them correctly. <laughs> So that's, that's, I've learned to do that, y'all, you know, it's, um, anyway, we're all doing a little bit of guesswork with ancient languages. So more than any other passage in the New Testament, this chapter alone shows that biblical womanhood isn't biblical. It shows women in positions of ministry leadership in the early church doing the same work as men and being recognized the same as men. So let's read it together, Okay. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church at Sincrea, so that you may welcome her in the Lord as is fitting for the saints and help her in whatever she may require from you, for she has been a benefactor of many and myself as well. Greet Prisca and Aquila, who work with me in Christ Jesus and who risked their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles." Greet also the church in their house. Greet my beloved Eponitas, who was the first convert in Asia for Christ. Greet Mary, who has worked hard among you. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my relatives who were in prison before me. They are prominent among the apostles. I'm sorry, in prison with me. They are prominent among the apostles, and they were in Christ before I was. Greet Amplitus, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our co-worker in Christ, and my beloved Stachys. Greet Apelles, who is approved in Christ. Greet those who belong to the family of Aristobulus. Greet my relative Herodian. Greet those in the Lord who belong to the family of Narcissus. Greet those workers in the Lord, Tryphena and Tryphosa. Greet the beloved Persis, who has worked hard in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and greet his mother, a mother to me also. Greet Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermas, Patrobus, Hermas, and the brothers and sisters who are with them. Greet Philogus, Julia, Nerus, and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. You know, I just recently taught through... Um, Romans with Scott McKnight's reading Romans backwards, which is actually really good. And one of the things he does is he goes through there and parses out how many of those are probably house churches. And there's like five to six probable house churches in that, pas in that passage. So that's, that's something else you can do, okay? Um, so there's lots of women in this passage. Did y'all hear them? There's 10, okay? Including Phoebe, named as a deacon, as well as Prisca, co-worker with Paul and a house church leader. Mary, who worked hard among you. And Junia, who's named as an apostle. Let's focus on her, okay? She's a lot of fun. Um, I haven't picked on the ESV yet. 
So let me do that. Hopefully I won't make any of you too mad. It's okay. You know, I will tell you, I'll say for the ESV, it is 92% exactly the same as the old RSV. So only 8% of things in the ESV have actually been changed. Unfortunately, they mostly have to do with women, okay? You can let that sink in too. Um, so if you have an ESV, you will see a note next to Junia's name. It reads, or Junius. I won't ask you to raise your hand if you have that. You will also note that rather than described as outstanding among the apostles, Andronicus and Junia are well known to the apostles. Why does it do this? Well, because the ESV was created to combat what was perceived as the dangerous influence of feminism growing in the church. That's why it was. You can ask them. You can go read it. They say it. Many of the translators of the ESV are members of the Council for Biblical Manhood and Womanhood, and many have gone on to the Gospel Coalition. They describe it as unapologetically complementarian. Those are their words. And Junia, as an apostle, doesn't fit their complementarian perspective. So they changed it. And that's, that's the truth of it. The ESV wasn't the first translation committee to find Junia problematic. New Testament scholar Eldon J. App compiled two tables surveying Greek New Testaments from Erasmus through the 20th century. Together, the charts show that the Greek name Junia was almost universally translated in its female form. Until when? When do y'all think it stopped being translated in its female form? Let's do this. This is fun. It's always fun to wake people up. When do you think? Shout out a century for me. Okay, 16th. I hear 16th. Anybody else? I hear 20th. Anyone else? 21st, ha, uh, yeah. Um, anyone else? Anyone else want to guess? Okay, you know what? Actually, two of you are right. 16th century, Martin Luther does this because he doesn't like Junia as a female apostle, but nobody actually follows him with this until the 20th century. It's the 20th century where we see this. And in the 20th century, the name Junia suddenly begins to be translated as the masculine Junius. It, Junius becomes the name used in several English Bibles, including the 1978 and 1984 NIV, the 1970 NEB, the 1970 Roman Catholic New American Bible, the American Standard Version of 1901, the 1952 and 1971 Revised Standard Version, and even the 1995 New American Standard Bible. Why? Beverly Roberts Gaventa explains to it. She says, Epp makes it painfully maddeningly clear that a major factor in 20th century treatments of Romans 16:7 was the assumption that a woman could not be an apostle. Junia became Junius because modern Christians assumed that only a man could be an apostle. Biblical womanhood was read into the text instead of the text being used to understand women's roles. Junia couldn't be a woman because modern evangelical culture argued that women couldn't be spiritual leaders. Yet scholarship has so overwhelmingly demonstrated that Junia is the correct name and that it is a woman's name that most of these translations have had to back down. They have to admit that Junia is a woman. So a different tactic had to be taken by translators attempting to diminish Junia's apostolic authority. The ESV is a good example. Instead of noted or outstanding among the apostles, Junia is denoted too well known to the apostles. They concede she was a woman, but they refuse to recognize her as an apostle. I'm about 100% certain, y'all, that if Junia had originally been a masculine name, no one would ever have questioned the attribution outstanding among the apostles. The only reason it became a question is because she is a woman, okay? Junia had to be explained away because evangelical ideas about biblical womanhood said a female apostle shouldn't exist. Have I gotten your attention a little bit? Okay. I could say a lot more. I'll say, I'm trying to see what time it is there. Oh, okay, I still have a few minutes. So I'll, I'll give this last point. Um, We've just seen that the so-called biblical womanhood readings of women like Martha, of Bethany, and even Junia are not actually biblical. Martha looks like a domestic hostess, not because she is one, but because we have read that into the text. This is made even more egregious because we have obscured her true role as a woman in ministry. 
Junia often appears as a male apostle, not because she was one, but because we changed her name to fit our assumptions about male-female gender roles. Biblical womanhood only appears to be biblical because we have changed the biblical text, which is really funny to me because that's the opposite accusation that is given towards people who support women in ministry. So I'm just going to summarize my final point for you, which I actually spend a time talking about in the book. These earlier two points, um, the first one, Martha, I don't talk very much at all about in the book. This last one, I spend quite a bit of time on in the book. So I'm just going to summarize it for you. And it is one of the Pauline texts of terror, as Phyllis Tribble has called them. Paul is often considered to be the shining star for complementarians. Remember those verses at the beginning of this talk? Paul tells wives to submit to their husbands, he tells women they can't teach men, and he tells women to be silent. Did he really say those things to women? And I'm not talking about taking scripture out of the text. I'm talking about how we have read those texts. Could he really have said those things if he recognized a woman in Romans 16 as an apostle, as a deacon, as a house church leader, as a teacher, as someone who was entrusted with the book of Romans and was the first person to read the book of Romans to the followers in Rome? Could he really have said those things with Romans 16 in the background? Why do we always start with the text of terror? What if we started with Romans 16? Anyway, that's an aside. Um, so let's start with that text of terror. What if we have so ignored the historical context of Paul's letters that we have just missed Paul's point? 1 Corinthians 14, 33 through 36 provides a great example of this. It says, as in all the churches of the saints, women should be silent, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be subordinate as the law says. If there's anything they desire or know, let them ask their husbands at home. Paul declares that women are to be silent, subordinate, and reliant upon the spiritual authority of their husbands. Except I don't think he did. If we take this passage and place it in the context of Roman history, as well as compare it to Paul's rhetorical patterns, Okay, Paul's a trained speaker, and he models patterns that he was taught in the Roman world. And one of those patterns is citing the opponent and then refuting it. It's called the, the quotation method. What if we find that rather than instructing women to ask their husbands at home, Paul is quoting a Roman practice and then admonishing the Corinthians for practicing it. Do you know how remarkably similar Paul's words sound to Roman texts? Take, for example, Cato's speech during the 3rd century BC and we're told by Livy in the 1st century AD. Livy writes that Cato is admonishing women who are running around in public, blocking streets, speaking to other women's husbands. What kind of behavior is this, Cato asked. Could you not have asked your own husband the same thing at home? Livy records these words by Cato in his history of Rome. He was a very popular writer. Everybody knew his stuff. And so it doesn't surprise me as a historian that echoes of Livy could have ended up in the letter of Paul. So just think back to the text. It says the women should keep silent, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be subordinate, as even the law says. What law? That was my words. If there is anything they desire to know, let them ask their husbands at home. It's not word for word what Cato was saying, but it's really close. It's a definite echo. Could Paul's words be quoting from his Roman context? Cato's speech isn't the only Roman text to convey this sentiment about women. It is all over the Greco-Roman world. It is no surprise that Paul, an educated Roman citizen who would have been very familiar with Greco-Roman views about women, was concerned that Christians in Corinth were imposing pagan Roman restrictions on women. So he quoted the Roman worldview and then countered it. Did y'all know in verse 36 there's a little word that is often left out of many translations? It's the word what. Almost all translations, all Bibles translated as what in another place but they often leave it out or translate it differently here. It's interesting. What, Paul says, after stating the Roman view of women. Y'all know that? He says, after for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church, goes on a little bit, and then it says, what? 
Did the word of God originate with you? Or are you the only ones it has reached? If anyone thinks that he is a prophet, he should acknowledge that what I am writing to you is a command of the Lord. When verses 34 through 35 are read as a quotation, Paul is distinguishing between Roman patriarchy, women be silent, and Christian behavior. What? Did the word of God originate with you? He could be quoting the Roman worldview to counter it with the Christian worldview. Just think about that. Instead of telling women to be silent like the Roman world do, did, what if Paul was actually telling men that in the world of Jesus, women could speak? From this perspective, when Christians use 1 Corinthians 14 to silence women, they are perpetuating the very practice that Paul condemned. I can't help but think about the words of Baptist theologian Frank Stagg as he observed, the preoccupation for male authority over women is pagan. It is anti-gospel. It cannot be redeemed. It can only be aborted. It is a negation of the gospel of Christ. Which brings us back to Legan Duncan's first point about biblical womanhood. Remember, he argues that biblical womanhood is biblical and egalitarianism, or this idea that women are called to leadership too, is not. But I think he got it backwards. Instead of reflecting the Bible, biblical womanhood reflects the patriarchy of the Roman world. Isn't it ironic that by endorsing biblical womanhood, evangelicals are supporting a gender hierarchy that isn't actually biblical? Okay, it's time for questions, y'all. So let me conclude really fast. I'm a medieval historian, and despite all of the biblical scholarship I've just done, I want to leave you with the words from one of my favorite medieval sermons. It's from a 15th century manuscript known today as Longleat House Manuscript 4. Just listen to this. The daughter of Eve was the beginning of damnation for mankind, but the faith of women in the new law was the beginning of salvation for mankind. For the faith of Our Lady, St. Mary, was the beginning of all salvation. Mary Magdalene was the first messenger of life, the first messenger of Christ's resurrection to the apostles, who had fallen from faith during his passion. As St. Paul says, the man of false belief shall be saved by a woman of right belief. Perspective matters. Biblical womanhood doesn't actually reflect what the Bible says. It reflects what we have made the Bible say because we carry to it our own cultural perspective. Which means, y'all, that biblical womanhood just isn't biblical. So, thank you. <laughs> All right. So, that was fun. <laughs> but Hopefully this so. is the really fun part, okay? <laughs> so before uh, you think about leaving, gang, this is gonna be so good right here. We're getting a lot of great questions. They're coming. You can still text your questions in. Um, our team down here is, you know, sending them my way. So we'll try to get to as many as possible, That's right? That's great. The first one, so I asked you this the first time we talked on the phone because this was most important for me, whether I was gonna, gonna have you here or not. Yeah. Uh, being from <laughs> North Carolina, um, UNC or Duke? I mean, uh, yeah. who, who you got? What I didn't know that was the test when you asked me that. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so I'll Did you did your graduate work? At, I did my graduate yeah. work at Chapel Hill, and the funny thing is, is that I don't actually care. Uh, which, okay, you know, we, and which proves that you're not from North Carolina. <laughs> you're a Texan. Uh, so I did half of my graduate work at Duke, um, uh, which you know so I you think went to both. You I both. went to both, kind mm. of, but uh, Carolina. They had prettier robes. Yeah. So that's why my PhD is from Carolina. Like the color better. Too. Yeah. Yeah. So there good. you are. Okay. That's a good answer. Good answer. All right. So, hey, tell us, um, tell us about your personal experience about being a woman yeah. uh, in the church. I mean, you grew up in the Baptist church, and then you, you write about this in the book. But, but uh, tell us a little bit about that story. Yes. Okay. So I do. I talk. I did talk about my personal life here tonight, but it is a story that I interweave throughout the book. Um, and I grew up, I grew up a Baptist. I grew up a, in a small Texas town, Southern Baptist Church. Um, but it wasn't really until, you know, later on in my high school years, and this actually coincides when, when we see this emphasis on biblical womanhood starting to rise. In fact, if you could actually go, if you go to um, the Google analytical tool, you can type in biblical womanhood, then the word, and you see it like shoot mm. up through the roof um, in the late 80s. So it's actually fun to do. Uh, but I remember when that began to sort of filter down into, into my church. And by the time I got to college, 
Um, everybody was reading Elizabeth George, Elizabeth Elliot, um, Recovering Biblical Manhood and Womanhood was also a text. And so it was in the water everywhere around. And I'd also grown up in a time when James Dobson, everybody read James Dobson. And James Dobson is sort of lays the foundation for what the Council for Biblical Manhood You even and write Womanhood about comes. and remember, like me, yeah. some will remember... Bill Gothard even prior yes. to that, right? Yeah, yeah, Bill Gothard too. He's part of the story. You know, yep. historians used to think he was a fringe person, but now they realize that he actually laid a lot of this groundwork that then was picked up on by people like James Dobson. And it's a fascinating That's story. So one of the things you're talking about here is what I realized yet again. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm old enough to remember a lot yeah. of this. Um, I'm old enough now to know history. I'm yes. part of history. <laughs> but um, that, that all of this biblical womanhood, as you define yes. it and many of us know it, is actually a more recent thing. It's yes. kind of a recent phenomenon. But yes. anyway, back to, we can talk more yeah, about that. Yeah, so but back my to story. Your story. So um, I met my husband in college, and we were pretty much, I mean, you know, everybody around us was kind of ascribing to complementarianism. Um, I have a pastor here who actually can attest to my husband and I when we were in college. Um, we didn't really, it was one of those things where it was what people gave lip service to, but it didn't really impact us so much. I mean, I don't think our marriage was ever modeled very much on that. And the pastor who's sitting here can also attest that I always pushed against it, um, even from a very young age. Um, but I did still accept this idea that women are called to, um, to, that men are called to leadership roles within the church. Um, this was something that was, I, that I just accepted as what it was supposed to be. And it wasn't really till I got to my graduate work at Chapel Hill that I suddenly began to realize that not only were there these images in the Bible of women who were filling in in these leadership roles, which had often been explained away as sort of anomalous, you know, Deborah preaches because no men will stand up and do it. Um, I began to realize that biblical womanhood that I was being taught looked just like the pagan ancient world I was learning about in my history classes. Oh. And that's what really started getting my attention was that whereas Christians are called to be different from the world, but we treat women just like everyone else. Mm -hmm. And that was my starting place. And at the same time, your husband was serving as a youth minister. At, yes. And so you had your kind of awakening yes. moments. He was we also. We were at a very complementary church at that point in time which was becoming increasingly complementarian while we were there. When we got there, women were teaching Sunday school. Um, and by the time we had been there for several years, women had pretty much disappeared from all of those types of leadership roles. And so it was becoming more oppressively complementarian at the same time that my husband and I were beginning to realize that we no longer subs could subscribe to this idea. Um, and in fact, we began to be very concerned about the impact we, we had youth um, our church wasn't anywhere near the size of this church, but we had about 70 kids in our youth group, and we had a great deal of concern for what was going on in their heads when we were teaching those young men that there was something about their bodies that made them able to lead in a way that women could not. And this is really the crux of it. When you say that there is something about a person because of their bodies that they are unable to be in leadership, um, then you are saying that there is an ontological difference mm -hmm. and that one person is, is under the other person. Wow. This and is I, also the argument for racism. And I've heard, yes, yeah. they, they parallel, mm -hmm. right? They parallel. Because you're objectifying the yes, person. Yes, that's exactly so, right. So um, you write about this in your book uh, a bit as well. Um, that, yeah, so we could go to, we could talk about purity culture, but we really oh, don't yeah. have time to do that. Because <laughs> I was a youth that's minister during that thing. time, the whole yes. true love waits and all that. And oh, really, yeah. The male, you know, he can't control himself. It's exactly So right. women, you cannot, right? It's all about your body and you can't do this. In fact, you, you might be a little evil if you kind of go there because if men... You wear tank tops. Right, wear, yeah. right, right. And, or go to youth camp and you have to wear... One-piece like, swimming suit with a T-shirt over it. Yes. Y'all been there? Okay. Yeah. And, and even, I mean, even hearing that, we're going, well, yeah, that's good, that makes sense. You know, <laughs> I, have a, I have a son and all that. You know, I have daughters as well. But yeah. uh, so tell me this. What does your family... Currently, what are you doing there in Waco? Yeah. So one of the things that even as I was going through this journey for um, sort of moving away from this idea of biblical womanhood, um, I never lost my faith in God. Uh, that's one thing that never has happened because I never 
I, I knew it wasn't God that had the problem. <laughs> I knew it was us. That it's always us who has the problem. And so <laughs> I never questioned my, my faith in God. And so my, some people have described my journey as deconstruction. And I'm like, no, it's not deconstruction at all because I didn't deconstruct my faith. Um, I deconstructed what we had built around our faith. Oh, that's good. And, and there's a, we've done all that with a lot of things. And so my husband and I are very still very solid. Um, in the Baptist world, my husband's a Baptist pastor at a very, very small church. We went a very different track um, after all of this. I tell in the book the story about how my husband lost his job through this process. Um, and so we are now at a very small church um, that um, is quite different. And it's a church that also had a woman in the pulpit in the 1930s, a Baptist church. And so I actually write about that also in the book, which oh, I that's really like. That's, that that's church. a church. Oh, yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. I learned about her through being at the church. Really cool. It was really cool. But she was only kind of designated as the wife of this man. Yeah, it's even really then. funny. Even then, the way that she gets in um, to do it. And I, of course, you know, in the church, I like, I found all of the, the documents. You know, wow. it's a small Baptist church. And they mm -hmm. have like all of their notes from, their min from the meetings up you know, the early 20th century. They have them all. Yeah, so yeah. I like took them all home with me. And um, I still have them. Because I'm a historian. Yeah. I'm, I'll give them back. Um, but oh, you still have them. Okay. <laughs> Yes. So I've seen, you know, it's great, the notes and the things that they wrote yeah. about her. So I'm, I'm encouraged. Um, I mean, you're still in. Yes. Like, you're still Baptist. Very solid. Not all of us are Baptist here. No, I And am. those who are not are like, what are y'all thinking? You know, people have asked me why I'm still Baptist. And um, on the one hand, while I do believe there can be Christians in all branches of, of Christian, I mean, what matters is the gospel of Jesus. Right. And so as long as we adhere to the gospel of Jesus, some, our ecclesiology, how we practice church, we can vary on. But I like the Baptist ecclesiology. Mm -hmm. I like committees. I like people voting <laughs> on things. Yes. You know, I want to okay. have people involvement. So yeah. I'm thoroughly Baptist. That's, in that's so sense. good. Yeah. Okay. Can I get an amen? Come I on, do like go. committees. I really do, y'all. Um, um, that's, like, like that's how you get things done. You like committees. That's how you get things done. It is. I think that's true. I mean, the women in the WMU oh. could have ruled the world. We ruled the world. They really could hey, have. Hey, and here's the thing. Here's the thing off. that I've learned. Sure enough, when you, when you have women at the table, okay, of any committee or yes. whatever else, changes the <laughs> Change the game. Just think about the WMU, y'all. I mean, there's a, so many histories that need to be written about the importance of the WMU. I think that's one of the problems in Baptist churches today no is have. that the WMU has declined. Yeah, Seriously, yeah. we should all go restart it. Okay, so here's a great question. I grew up in a complementarian home, and it seemed to work just fine. What do you say to someone who says, we're good? Yeah. So, no, that's very easy. As I said, I sort of lived in that world um, where it didn't really affect things. It was lip service. I didn't really want to be a pastor, so it didn't bother me that I, that I wouldn't have been allowed to be a pastor. But what you find, and I love one of my favorite theologians is a woman named Lucy Pepiot. She's just lovely. If you want to read her work, she's very accessible too. And she says, you have to think about where your theology goes. What is the end result of your theology when you carry What's it? What's the trajectory of What is of the trajectory the, of your uh, theology? And when your theology starts with a place that there are some people who are by nature underneath other people, then where does that take you? And that explains a lot of what's going on in the SBC right now. Wow. I mean, it's just, it's so, so crystal clear. So you use, you seem to... Instead of even complementarity, you call it patriarchy. Yeah. You, you do that intentionally. I do. And talk, talk to me about that. Yes. So um, I am a historian. I have gotten pushback on the word patriarchy. You know, some people are like, well, that doesn't sound very nice. And I'm like, well, you know, that is what it is. Um, and, and, and also, <laughs> you, even in seminary, we learn about the patriarchal fathers. Yes, and right? yes. There are different types of patriarchy. You know, in some sense, the patriarchy is you can just talk about the male household head. Um, but then patriarchy is the system in which women are always under. They are always under men. No matter how much education they get, no matter their salaries are always less than men. This is patriarchy. Um, and complementarianism is sort of, um, you know, uh, same song, different verse of patriarchy. And the originators of complementarianism, you can actually, you can go back and look at this in the late, they actually had a conversation in a hotel in um, we, outside of Wheaton 
college. It never and, goes well, uh, by the way. Yeah, but. I don't know. But anyway, you're right. But um, they had a conversation, and they were intentionally trying to find a different word from patriarchy. Patriarchy is what they used. Russell Moore actually argued in mm. 20, in 2006 mm. that patriarchy was the better word. But they he's all a, kind He's of arguing for a kind of a Christian biblical patriarchy, patriarchy up against yeah. a secular He patriarchy. says that Christians, patriarchy is wives only submitting to their husbands, whereas secular patriarchy is women submitting to everyone. So he tries to try to distinguish that. Um, but they used the word complementarity because they thought it sounded better. Okay. And so that's where the word. So in the beginning, they recognized it as patriarchy. So And again, really recent. Mm -hmm. And this is recent history. We, yes. I think a lot of us think it's always been 1987, like 1987, I think, is when they got together for that breakfast. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so here's another good question. I love my church home, but they don't allow women in leadership roles. What yeah. uh, do you have any advice? Yes, I do have advice. Uh, you know, I often tell people that if we hadn't gotten thrown out, we might have still been there because I think, you know, I think the only way to change churches is to change churches. The only way to change minds is to have people who are continually pressing and pushing and saying, let's read this, let's talk about this, let's think about this. Um, and so that's what you do is you get people to start reading, get people to start looking at different ideas and understand that it might take people a long time. Some people may never go there with you, but if, you, if they can even recognize that this isn't part of the gospel, and that women are called to spaces of teaching. You know, one of the best ways to, um, to simply begin to change some minds about women in churches is to put women in teaching positions. Because once you see, I don't know if y'all have heard some women yeah. preachers, but, you know, I've heard some and I walk away and I'm like, that woman's called. There yeah, is, yeah, yeah. Y'all heard Beth Moore? Right. I mean, oh my gosh, y'all. Yeah. Um, so if you talk about a preacher. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, and then over time... It becomes normative, if yes. you will, right? Yeah. So, well, yeah. I would say, as a as a pastor, we have other pastors here as well. Um, one of the things that we've done on our staff team is just that: read, right? right. Read. So, we've we've read Katie Cole's book that's developing uh, female leaders yes. in the church, which is a great yes. book. We've got our whole staff team reading your book. Oh, where we, thank and you. So, I think it's just you know, it takes it takes some leadership, right? But again, we, we're on a journey together yes. here. And so we're not afraid to say, let's talk about this. Well, and you can't go from zero to 60 overnight. Yeah. But you said, so your advice, uh, I, I thought you were going to go a different route. Like, I thought you were going to say, well, come, come to Park City's Baptist Church. But you didn't say that. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. But no. But you can do that too. But no, what you, what you said was stay in, stay. You, you even said if we would have stayed because yeah. you want to be a part of the, of the change, right? A you know, I, I mean, I think the answer for this is different for every person. I don't think anybody can tell you when it's time to leave or if you should leave. I think, I think, I think some, I think there are some people who are called to stay. I've said this before. Um, I think, I think it becomes clear when you can no longer do what God has called you to do. Um, then it, you know, it might be time to go. Um, but, and there's different ways of leaving. I mean, there's all sorts of theories about it. The other factor in me, the sort of where I hit my limit with it, was when I realized that I didn't want my children being taught. I didn't want my son to hear that there was something about him that made him capable of leadership, that my, something wow. about my daughter that she could not. Oh, wow. your, your son in particular uh -huh. at, at the time. I, he, and I, that, he's the older. He's, he's the older. older. He's 17 and my daughter is 11. Uh-huh. So um, wow. that was something else too that I you know because we were in a church where the where that message was so hard that that was a concern for me. So mm. I think, but I do think that some people are called to stay because you got to have people on the inside as well as people on the outside. It's really good. Yeah, you know we could talk a long time about deconstruction. That's yes. a lot, a lot going on. Yeah. Um, but so many people leaving churches. I mean, mm -hmm. we're seeing a lot of new people here right. as well. Right. And during COVID. You know, I can know oh, as a, as a pastor yeah. um, about every decision you make or speak into something, about 50% of your people are going to be upset. Right. So it, yes. it's caused people to go, I don't, I don't know. I mean, it's been a really hard time to lead yeah. anything, right? No. It's been a hard season this year and a half. It's been. So. And, and I think, you know, as Baptists, I think one of the things Baptists have always done is emphasize the importance of the community of the church mm -hmm. and the body. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really time that all of us have to lean into churches. Um, T tell me this. So... so so there's some great questions here, and I'm, I'm drawing from these questions. A lot of questions about the um, yeah. 
about translation yeah, of scripture because yeah, yeah, yeah. you went there. Yes, and so I think I did a lot of people there. are going, okay, okay. Um, there's a lot around this. So you, you write much about the ESV. There's really a, a, a male kind of leaning there, there right? Is. I've recently, from the ESV, I'm like, so brothers. And actually, and always, parenthetically. Sometimes it's um, brothers. Y'all, this sisters, actually yeah. can be brothers and sisters. Yes. Okay, this is everybody, but yep. it's not translated that way. No. So someone asked, um, would you have kind of, how would you guide us? Like, would you yeah. have a favorite um, translation? Yeah, so um, I, I do want to say this. Uh, don't go home and burn any Bibles. Um, all, all modern English translations are about 90 to 95% the same. Um, there are only small variations between most most of the Bibles. And so the main thing is to be aware. Be aware of who translated your Bible. Go read. Mm. Go read the preface <laughs> to the beginning. It often tells you who the translators are. Yeah, yeah. Go look and see, see, you know, see why they translated it, why they made the changes. And it tells you a lot. Um, so I, I would just be aware. And my favorite, I actually, and I talk about this in the book, is that I sort of um, started moving in this direction around the same time that the Today's New International Version came out, which caused quite a stir. It's mm -hmm. always made a great impression on me. So I have my TNIV. I still like my TNIV. Okay. My husband stole it from me to preach from. So which you can't no find on new version. You can't, but the NIV 2011 is. is pretty much the same as okay. the TNIV. Oh, pretty much the, yeah, pretty much the same. Yeah, pretty much the same. Okay, There's some so differences. there was big uproar, and it's not that much different. Is what you're saying. Well, they did away with the title, Today's New Interview, and they just went back to the old NIV, but they kept the translations. <laughs> the, that's what's on you version? The yeah, the NIV 2011 is mostly oh, the I didn't same know that. Okay, as the so TNIV. it is the new. I should, I yeah, think. I mean, there's some variations. They didn't go exactly the way as the two, Today's, but it's very much. Um, I've heard great things about the CEB, the mm -hmm. Common English Bible. I'd, I haven't ever used it just because I do the NIV and the NRSV. Okay, I like the NRSV. so here, here's there's another question around this, um, and and so as as Baptist, mm -hmm. right? Um, the Reformation takes yeah. place. We're Protestants. We're protesters. Is who we are. We like to protest. Yes. Um, but people who disagree with us, we love right. to do that. But um, as as Baptist and as those who really believe in the priesthood of the believer, one of our core distinctives. Yes. Um, I think there's, you know, some of what you shared tonight, if you haven't read the book, even reading the book, it could be a little troubling for people to right. go, wait, so I've been reading the Martha story wrong, like, all my life, and so some would be like, this is troubling, like, can I read the Bible for myself, and isn't that, or can I go in my closet and just read it and understand it? Yeah. And and the truth is, and I'd say this as a pastor, too, I think you would agree, um, yes and no. Right. Right? That's exactly, Yes. So yes. talk to us about that. Yeah, no, I think that's right. I'm, and this is something that we've always, we have so much individualism in our culture that we want to be able to read texts completely without any help. But, and we can, you know, the biblical, the gospel comes through no matter what version of the Bible that you have. Um, the gospel comes through. Um, the problem, though, is that there are some cultural elements that we simply don't know because we don't know that history. And, and so, and those parts can change what I call the little stories of the Bible. And th sometimes those little stories are things that can have a big impact, like slavery. Not like so little. Women. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And and the You're reason... You're saying not core, not the big story. Right, not the big story, story, but yeah, th things that aren't core to the gospel. Mm -hmm. and, and those we get wrong because we refuse to put texts in context. Mm -hmm. And that does take discipline. I mean... Christian life takes discipline. Why do we think reading the Bible doesn't take discipline? Doesn't uh, take discipline and study? Yeah. yeah. So you would expect a, a pastor preacher to say this, but it's why the gathering, it's why the past year yes. and a half have been so challenging because yeah. there are times when you need someone trained, understanding how to exegete right. a passage, understand context, yes. to talk about it yes. instead of just, I, I can do this on my own. That's exactly I love Jesus, right. I'm going to read this. And there's also, we see a, a kind of this running I don't know if I call it anti-intellectualism that takes that's taking place in culture now. Yep. Right. Yep. Because I've got the internet. I can Google this. Uh, yes. We're seeing this with when, when the <laughs> medical community is trying to tell us a little bit about COVID and such too. Right. And we're like, nah, I, no. And and so conspiracy theories run amok among so Christians, on evangelicals. Very much among Christians. That's, yeah. Is there a tie there? What's going on? Yeah. No. I mean, um, this uh, it. 
this anti-intellectualism is has a long history in American Christianity. Um, you can really go back to the early 20th century with something called the fundamentalist modernist controversy, um, and which there was sort of this idea of, because of the priesthood of all believers, there was mm -hmm. this idea that well, God, I can understand the Bible and I can preach it, and I don't need anybody teaching me or telling me how to do it. And the people who teach me and tell me how to do it are going to lead us astray. And so there becomes this big sort of gap, um, and a lot of the evangelical churches like Baptist were part of this more of were more on the side of the anti-intellectual tradition mm. um, which also began to create this hostility between um, professors <laughs> and the church and have you all ever wondered why a lot of the church history textbooks and stuff you read aren't actually written by academics they're written by no offense wow. pastors uh -huh. who aren't maybe yeah, trained yeah, yeah. in those areas at all you know well, now if you it's, think now about it just tiktok that's my, my no, it's just tiktok that's all you need you just need tiktok you just twitter there. a whole twitter thread right. you can just go read and find out everything like that exactly um and the problem is is that it doesn't as i the discipline is lacking in order to understand the word of god and so yeah i think there is a disconnect there is a connect which creates a great disconnect okay for so us. we got one more question or so Lori, can I get like one or two? Can I, I'm gonna go, here we go. She said two. Okay, it, we, got, we got some great questions. <laughs> I'll go fast. You can, you all, you're gonna have to read the book because she's answered a lot of these questions. But um, if the gospel of Jesus and sharing the gospel of Jesus is the most important part of, um, hold on, my phone's blowing up on me here, is the most <laughs> important part of our faith, why does the complementarian church go to such great lengths to disqualify women as an equally important part of the gospel being shared in the world today. <laughs> like if, if the gospel, yes. that's what we're really trying to do, but then Jesus, some would think, would step in into the conversation and say, uh, but you're a woman, so. You can't do this part of it. Yes, that is the question. That, I mean, that's what's so ironic about this, um, so frustrating about this, is that you are limiting God. And why do we keep trying to limit God? Why do we keep saying, oh, God, you can only use these people, but you can't use these people? Um, and, and that, to me, the Bible, if we look in the narrative of the Bible, God always put, when people try to limit God, God always shows them that they're wrong. <laughs> I mean, this is this happens over and over again um, in the biblical text, and so I mean, you can even think one of the things that I've done as a um, that I picked up as a medieval scholar is I realized that in medieval stories about women, they always focus a lot on women's faith more so than they focus men and women in sermon stories in the medieval world are often the ones that don't have faith, whereas the women do, and they actually pick this up from the Bible. If you go look at it, it's the women in the New Testament who have faith. They're almost always the ones that Jesus says, you are of strong faith. He doesn't ever say that to oh. the disciples. Yeah. He says, you are of weak faith. He no. says, where is your faith? And, it, you know, he does this. It's not saying, I don't think he's saying that women ha are capable of having more faith than men. I think he's just turning the tables on what we think. And he's emphasizing the faith of women in a culture that would have always emphasized the male yeah, leadership. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And it's no small thing. He, he first appears to marry, marry a woman who becomes the first person ever to proclaim the yes. gospel. She's been kind of the apostle She's of the, the apostle. The, to the, the apostles. evangelist to the apostles. The apostle. Exactly right. Um, yeah. So yeah. even there. So that's why some would argue, I don't know that I need permission. Um, like some people want to put Paul up against Jesus, right? Right. And, and Which is also problematic if you think about that. Right. <laughs> well, I, I noted there. I saw. I read a post, that, and it was entitled um, "Some, you know, some some liberal types or whatever placing Paul's words over Jesus' words." Right. You know, I'm like, wait, wait. Who are you going to go with if that's yeah. the case? Jesus. Um, but even there, what what I try to teach our people is when you see things that seem contradictory, mm -hmm. um, and such a key key part of this is a recent understanding for me i think in some ways or maybe to articulate it to understand scripture really through the lens of the way of jesus yeah because jesus is perfect theology right embodied yes and you don't see jesus saying no 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 like, whoa you know pulling the reins on women it's, you see him releasing women it's where we start as i said why do we always start with the texts that say women be silent and women um, cannot have authority over men, why don't we start with Jesus who always let women speak and Romans 16? And if we do that, it just flips it. And we realize 
we cannot be interpreting those verses as saying women can't do this for all time because they simply do not match with what we see Jesus doing or what we see going on throughout the rest of mm -hmm. Paul. Mm -hmm. um, not only do we make Paul inconsistent with Jesus, but we make Paul inconsistent with himself. With himself. Yeah, First Timothy 3, exactly. and yet he's allowing women to speak yes. in, uh, you know, in the church exactly that he's right. established yes. in Romans 16. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry, gang, we're going to have to have one more, okay? And she so said maybe. You, many of y'all are like, please, my. And this one, this is a good one, um, and a little different. What, what is good scriptural response to complementarians who cite the Genesis creation account, uh -huh. we haven't gone there, yeah. as support for their position? Male created first, then woman created as a helper, helpmate, for him. I could give more detail, but no, I trying to it. make this short. No, no this, this is, is that's the person. This I'm is really, gonna make it short in the text. So yeah, go. no, this is this I love this. I love this, y'all, because if you look at the text, you know, if the argument is is that Adam um, is you know, the argument is that Adam gets to because he's created above all of the animals, et cetera, like that, and so therefore he is given stewardship over them. Um, and so if you have that order of creation argument that puts Adam above, well, who's the next person God creates? You know, Eve. So if you follow the logic of the order of creation argument. Oh, it goes it's the other way. E yeah, 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 it goes the other way. It's e I mean, this just doesn't make Eve's sense. Eve's at the pinnacle it, of it all It doesn't creation. make sense. Yeah, Eve's at the pinnacle. So then you're like, oh, okay, well, no, we didn't mean that actually. But that word <laughs> helper doesn't actually, that just means helper. It means the follower, supporter. And you're like, okay except for that's not what that word means. Mm. That word is actually used um, to indicate sort of this leadership position, this Azer woman um, who is this, who is not, who really is the helper in the sense of being somebody who leads and who is gifted by God. And so that doesn't work either. I've also heard the so, argument from even like Genesis 3 and people forget, wait, this is after, this is after the fall that actually you're to be under the man, right? That's where you're going to land. He's going to work really hard, but you're going to be Yeah, under. the curse. I love this. You know, one of the questions I always ask is, um, why do we think we're supposed to, why are we, why do we embrace the curse? Why don't we embrace the, thing. Yeah. the world that Jesus wanted for us? You know, why do wow. we try to live in sin instead Ooh. of trying, I mean, really? And um, I mean, I, it's always crazy to me. It's like, well, why are are we supposed to stay in that sinful world yeah. or are we supposed to go for the better world that yep. Jesus gave for us? So this is so this is the big, really, I guess, premise and really throughout your book. And I, I'm gonna encourage everybody to get it tonight. If we run out of them, go buy it, okay? Send it to friends um, and read and, and, and talk about it because this is a conversation worth having. Now, so that really through a lot of us, I think, come to this. Minds are blown tonight, okay? And... And a lot of us come to this and say, but it's always been this way. And yeah. this is kind of your point. Like, yeah. but no, men have always been like in leadership. Mm -hmm. And this all, and you're, you're as if it's like written in the stars or there's God ordained, all that. Um, and you're arguing, okay, no, that's the way of the world. That is the way of the world. It's the way of the fall, mm -hmm. not the way of Jesus. That's exactly right. Okay. That is. I mean, you know, the argument that, that it has always been this way, I'm like, yes. And it's always been this way in pagan cultures. It's always been this way in every culture in the world has patriarchy that looks very much like the evangelical brand. And so I think that should make us pause wow. and say, why do we just look like people who don't know Jesus? And that's, wow. yeah. So it was in our difference. I mean, you look at the early church. It was in our distinctive, apart from culture, that made us so compelling. Right. Now... We've been co-opted by partisan politics. Yep. We have, and, and we don't look, we look like the world. We look like right? the world. And you're saying, well, this is just another yeah, kind of. Yeah. Now, what do what people, this is where people want to run with the secular idea that is, no, actually the culture is a little ahead of us perhaps in this. Am I right? Yeah, well, it's sort of interesting what we see happen with the, with the backlash that, did y'all know that there was Baptist women being ordained until the 1960s? Did y'all know that? Up until the 1960s. Well, yeah, ni well, actually, 1967 was the first time that we have a woman officially um, in the Southern Baptist Church, is we have a woman ordained in the Southern Baptist Church. Um, 1977 is the conservative resurgence, mm -hmm. um, where suddenly, and this is sort of the, as a historian, this is interesting, this is sort of like after the war, women are in men's jobs, everybody starts changing 
changing the rules to put women out of those jobs. Like they start saying things like you can't be pregnant and working. So they fire women from their jobs so that the men could take them. This is, this is what happened. And this is also what happened in the evangelical world because women start being trained in seminaries. They start taking over. They start preaching. They start being put in these jobs. And then all of a sudden we have this conservative resurgence that jumps in and says women can't be in these jobs um, because these are men only jobs. Bye -bye. And it's the same pattern with this. And so what we saw is we saw there was a movement and, and I think it should be shameful to us that we are letting a culture, culture. that doesn't know Jesus get something more right. Yes. Oh, wow. So. Oh, wow. Okay. So we don't have any more time. So y'all let's thank uh, Dr. Barr for being with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much. We appreciate you.